everybody. Um, for those who don't know, I am Major Jordan Hayes. I'm presently the Deputy Commander at Squadron 188 in Oakland. I'm also the Deputy Director of Communications for California Wing. More importantly, I'm a Master Observer. I have over 500 hours in CAP aircraft as a mission observer. I have 13 finds. I think I've participated in every different kind of CAP mission type that we do. All the weird ones, the uh, the radar one, the tsunami training, Imperial, WADS. And uh, I, I earned my mission observer rating at NISA in uh, 2013 and have been part of the Mission Air Crew School here in California for most of the time since then. We have uh, a, a number of instructors who will probably come and go throughout the, throughout the weekend. There's a lot of PowerPoint here, and I know that that can be frustrating for people. Hopefully, some of this information is information you already have. I mentioned this earlier for those of you who, who didn't hear it, but part of the reason we're doing this together is to try to make sure that all members of the crew have an expectation about what the rest of the people they're with are expected to know. You know, those of you who are certificated pilots, you'll recognize quite a bit of this information from the ground schools that you've taken to get your FAA ticket. But remember that mission observers are more likely than not to not be pilot. It's important for them, first of all, to learn this, but second of all, for you to have a good understanding of what other people will be knowing. Administrative items we have, the big one is here's today's schedule. It's pretty aggressive. We're going to try to make sure we get some short breaks in there. There's an awful lot of information here. I'm pretty comfortable with being able to deliver all of this, but if something slips by too quickly, by all means, raise your hand. And if nobody, you know, if, if whoever's presenting doesn't notice it right away, uh, interrupt. Uh, we're a small group here. We should be able to stop and, and make sure that you know, remember, the goal here is for everybody to get all of this information. So this is all based on the curriculum that comes from NISA, and NISA is a week long, including flying, and you have you know time in the classroom in the morning, and then you fly in the afternoon, typically five days in a row. That's a lot more time than we have. And so some of this stuff, we're actually going to tell people to go review on your own. What used to be the 60 series and is now the 70 series for air crew, but also 60-3 is important to review Take a look at those. We're not going to talk about those specifically today. There's some messages showing up in the chat about links to the NISA website. There's a lot of good information there. All of these slides are there also. By all means, if you want to re review these later, please do. The other thing is I want to say that this is not going to make you a great air crew member. The way to become a great air crew member is to become a good air crew member and then do it a lot. The seat time, the experience uh, is really important to being able to become a, an excellent air crew member. The way to become a good air crew member is to uh, go through this training, become a trainee, work toward getting the rating, and then do it a lot. A lot of these skills are perishable. It really takes a commitment to keep them fresh. Doing is much, much more important than knowing. Quick review of the mission pilot requirements. Uh, you need to be a qualified CAP VFR pilot, which means you need an active Form 5. You have to have at least 175 hours PIC time. That includes 50 hours of cross country before you can begin mission pilot training. You need uh, 200 hours PIC before you can take your Form 91. Keith Breton's going to talk about that some more tomorrow during that uh, mixed session. You need to be a qualified as a mission scanner, uh, qualified as a transport mission pilot. Got to be at least 18. You need the feminine prep training, which is what we're doing this weekend. By the end of the weekend, uh, after passing the test, you will get credit for all of the familiarization and preparatory training. Once you get commander approval that that's complete, you will become a trainee. You get two years to complete your training, which would include the Form 91. Like I said, you need 200 hours PIC. You've taken some FEMA classes, the 100 and 700. We need to add the 200 to that. Obviously, two exercise participations. For those of you who are going to Bakersfield, that will get covered there. And also ICUT. And I, I mentioned this to the folks who don't have ICUT yet, but since a big part of Mission Observer is talking on the radio, I suggest you get that done as soon as you can, earlier rather than later. Mission Observer uh, requirements to be a trainee, you need to be qualified as a mission scanner. You need to be 18. The famine prep training, which we're doing this weekend, commander approval. And then uh, once you get on to the advanced training, you need to finish all of those squitters, your two exercise participations, I cut, obviously same deal. You should have it done earlier rather than later. Those are the requirements. This is a list of all the squitter tasks we're going to cover this weekend. I'm not even going to review them. But what we will do is when we, just before the test on Sunday, we'll come back to this slide and hopefully we'll go through each of these tasks and make sure that everybody agrees that they receive training on these items using a sectional chart, using a pod table, all of these things. Those are the MP tasks. 
These are the MO tasks. Anyway, we'll come back to this during the review and make sure that everybody agrees that, that we did all of this. Uh, principal duties and responsibilities, the mission pilot, the primary responsibility of the mission pilot is to pilot the aircraft in a safe and proficient manner. Get the crew to and from the search objective legally and safely. That's 85% of being a mission pilot. Remember that you're a pilot, not a scanner. You have crew for that. There's a little note here that says, in addition to the duties, the pilot must perform all of the duties of the observer if no qualified observer is on board. This is very rare that you would be sent out with an unqualified observer, but it's very common that you'd be sent out with a trainee, someone who has had uh, famine prep and maybe some experience isn't fully rated yet. But I, I've had the the experience um, on a couple missions when I was a scanner uh, where we had no observer. And so as a scanner, I was sitting in the right seat and the mission pilot had to do, quote unquote, the observer duties, although being a pilot as well, I could help. So. Yeah, so operational missions, the ICs try really hard not to let that happen. Training missions, you might find that, especially if if the non-observer is a pilot, that can be helpful. But again, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that, I mean, really in 60-3, they talk about how famine prep training is really the minimum to keep the members safe. So we don't want to put you in a situation where you wind up being a hazard to yourself or or to the mission. But that's something to remember for mission pilot is is one of the one of the big things you're going to be doing is training observers. Those of you who are thinking of going directly to mission pilot and skipping mission observer, you might want to rethink that. So in addition to the duties of pilot and command, be responsible for obtaining the briefings and for planning sorties. Uh, thoroughly brief the aircrew before flight, including the briefing of their responsibilities during all phases of the flight. Obtain a proper flight release, just like any any flight. Enforce sterile copy rules <laughs> uh, if you have to. Uh, and the big one here: utilize CRM and ORM techniques and procedures. This is this is something that really sets uh, Civil Air Patrol a, apart from normal general aviation flying. Is the rich connection to both CRM and ORM procedures. Uh, as a mission pilot, you want to try to fly these search patterns as completely and precisely as possible. Keep track of and report any deviations from the prescribed patterns. We're going to talk later about the form 104A, which is uh, specific to search and rescue type sorties. It's kind of a uh, contract between the crew and the base staff. You basically fill out the one side that says, here's, here's what we're planning to do, and then come back and say, here's what we actually did. Uh, and there's lots of reasons why you did what you didn't plan to do. Obviously, that's common to not have plans survive contact with the enemy, as they say. But it's important to bring that information back because then that helps planning team figure out what else has to get done or if we need to do it differently or things like that. Keep an eye on the crew, the observer, and make sure that uh, everything that happened is recorded. If, if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. Try to make sure the forms are accurately, completely, and legibly filled out. The big issue there is that, you know, you may come back from a sortie, debrief, and go home and sleep. And if you wrote it terribly and it, the base staff can't understand what you wrote, that's going to be a hindrance to the success of the mission. So try to be careful about that. The observer duties and responsibilities. The primary responsibility during a search and rescue sortie while you're in grid is visual search. You are a scanner during those times. However, there's a lot of other time in the sortie generation that you have a bunch of other jobs. Obviously, be there for the briefings, assist in the planning. It says maybe mission commander. Our goal is to have the mission observer be the mission commander, again, to free the mission pilot, getting to and from the objective safely and legally. So this means running checklists, assisting in avoiding obstacles during taxi, which is every everybody's job. Set up the radios, operate the navigation equipment, help enforce the sterile cockpit rules, maintaining situational awareness. We'll talk about there's a whole module about this. System monitoring fuel status, assist the pilot during searches, particularly electronic searches. You know, that equipment is over on the right-hand side, almost impossible for the left seat to operate that equipment. Keep the mission base or a hybrid appraised uh, of the status. That means using the cap radio. Coordinate the scanner assignments. Uh, you're effectively the manager of whatever's in the back seat. If you're on a search and rescue uh, sortie, that's probably a scanner. If you're on a disaster relief sortie, that's that might be an, uh, an airborne photographer. If you're in a hybrid mission, it might actually be a, 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 re a repeater. But whatever that whatever's back there, you need to manage it as an observer. Keep the log, and we've got an example. I have a different one that I use. I'll share later. Make sure you're there for the debrief because obviously you have seen, hopefully, everything that happened on that sortie. Assist with all the post-mission paperwork, which means completing the 104, the, the aircraft log, those kinds of things. Keep track of any assigned equipment. We've got lots of different gadgets these days. 
that are in the plane. Make sure you uh, keep track of them, GPSs, tablets, and cameras. Ensure the aircrew obtains sufficient rest during crew rest periods. So you need to know what these uh, these duty day numbers are and, and how to navigate that. Talk about sterile cockpit a little bit. This recognizes flight operations other than routine cruise flight are intrinsically more hazardous and require undivided and vigilant attention of all crew members. Non-essential conversations and activities not directly related to the operation of the aircraft and its mission are inappropriate. So what this doesn't mean is sit down and shut up. Absolutely, we want to hear you discussing things that are important to that phase of flight. What we want to do is get rid of unnecessary communication. Nothing, you know, nothing about your plans for the weekend, uh, the fact that you saw the you know, the latest Top Gun movie, whatever that is. Pilot commanders are responsible to ensure that these non-essential conversations, activities, and otherwise distracting actions do not occur during those portions of flight. Different pilots will give you an indication of that. Some of them will put their hand up. Some of them will say, you zip it, something like that. I think it's usually pretty obvious when you're in a situation, but sometimes you're not. Maybe the radio is isolated and the pilot knows something that you don't. You know, my experience is you're always doing something. There's very little time to have conversations that you ought to have on the ground anyways. This is a super important aspect of that. Uh, the simplest way to ensure that this is true is as part of the briefing before startup, just agree what it's going to take to let everybody know that this is the time to really be focused on what's happening and not focused on anything else. It's essential that the PIC includes the sterile cockpit brief, a statement that safety of flight items are always appropriate to be brought to the immediate attention. Safety concerns, conflicting traffic, potential mechanical problems, smoke. George likes to say that if there's smoke in the back of the airplane, the scanner is going to see it first. Make sure to bring that up. Observer log, and there's lots of different ways to do this. There's a couple of good ones good structures. At the minimum, we need pre-flight calculations, record of observations. It's the basis for debriefing. It's the notes that you're going to you're gonna bring to a debrief. It helps you to fill in the 104 when you're on the ground. Information is forwarded to the mission staff. Good logs can be combined from several sorties to give the mission staff a better picture of how the search is going. This is in incredibly important when you're running multiple sorties with different crews to make sure everything gets written down and, and transmitted back to the base because otherwise people will go out there not knowing what's happening. Got a whole bunch of forms. They're all available in paper. Some of them are additionally available online and the migration towards the online version is not yet complete. These uh, should all be familiar to you by now. The 101, of course, is uh, your personal record of what ratings you have and whether you have trainee status or that kind of thing. The squitter forms, the 104 is critical to each sortie. That's basically your plan of action. And then later, the results of that plan. Weight and balance, ORM, these are things that all of you should have already been participating in in your cap flying. You might need a flight plan. These days, a lot of people do it directly from four flight, something like that. The 108 is to get your money back. And any of the ICS form observers in particular, it's good to carry around a 213, which is the message format a form, just a blank one in case you have to, to uh, take formal message traffic on the radio. Pretty much what I've already talked about, the 104 is the flight plan for any air sortie. The 104A is specifically for search and rescue. It's not in Wimmers. That's, that's still paper uh, worth having a, a, a blank one of those in your in your knee board. 108 is uh, how you get reimbursed. Talk about that more later. The forms are important. Like I said earlier, complete, accurate, and legible. You are implementing the CAP mission. Uh, you are out there, you're a field unit. You're out there doing the mission. Make sure you know the underlying uh, regulations. I, I like to say you don't have to memorize them, uh, but you are responsible for following them. And so you certainly should review them from time to time. The, the most important uh, regulatory skill, I think, is being able to recognize when you're in a situation that is covered by a regulation. You might not know what the regulation is, but you ought to be able to go find it pretty quickly and determine whether or not you're in line with the regulations. So I think that's a good way to, to sort of approach it. 